Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Thursday and Friday, and also our last day of thermodynamics. So we're done with thermodynamics. This is kind of our last day of review about it. I guess last days, because we're doing Thursday and Friday. But yeah, so last little bit of thermodynamics. And I think today's kind of an interesting topic. It's one that we super breezed over uh, in class. It was one of those days where I was like, yeah, I'm not going to be there, so you can do whatever you want. And here's a sub who has some videos, and then the sub was, I don't know, I remember Aiden had an issue with the sub, and it was a whole thing, and I don't know how much we saw from the videos. Um, <laughs> sorry to call you out, Aiden, if you're watching this. Um, but so what we're looking at here is kind of this, this cool overall objective, because it sounds really gimmicky, because um, it's kind of taking all these cool ideas in physics. But it's uh, it's actually all these things are related in a pretty obvious, well, we'll figure it out, a pretty obvious way. So we want to figure out and kind of be able to explain what does melting ice, perpetual motion, time travel, and the inevitable heat death of the universe have in common. The heat death of the universe being that eventually uh, there won't be any heat in the universe, everything will get cold, and we'll kind of uh, just kind of freeze out, which is cool. Well, not cool, but it's not going to happen in our lifetime. I know things are kind of bad this year, but it's not going to be like, oh, October 2020, what's up, heat death. Uh, we're not looking at that anytime soon. So <laughs> what we're going to do today is a quick little review about the second law of thermodynamics and statistical thermodynamics. Again, I put review in there because we didn't really go over it the first time. I don't know why I'm saying we. That's my fault. Um, I didn't super cover it the first time because it's a short little uh, topic, but hey, we got time now. Then I have some practice questions, so kind of like multiple choice style, just getting the concepts down, practicing with the concepts. And then a free response style question. Uh, I haven't made that yet, so maybe one and maybe two. I don't know. It depends how long this is. But yeah, so what we're going to start off with is this little thought experiment. So what we have is this chamber of gas, and there's this divider in the middle. And on the left side, we have these colder particles. They're moving with a lower average velocity. So they have a lower kinetic energy, which means they have a lower temperature. And on the right, we have these faster moving particles. And I'm kind of denoting the speed, excuse me, sorry, with the length of that streak. So on the right, we have the same number of particles, but they're moving faster. So they have a higher average kinetic energy. We're going to assume they're the same particle. And they have a higher temperature, therefore. So then what we're going to do is say, well, what's going to happen if we kind of take this divider away? So what would happen in this case? And is this one thing that I'm going to show you, is this allowed, what we're going to think about? What if we kind of have these particles, they collide with each other? What we would expect to happen, what usually we think about happening, is that we have these red particles, these faster particles, give energy to the slower particles. We have these collisions. Over time, we have a bunch of collisions. And eventually, our energy kind of averages out. But is there anything that's saying, hey, we can't do this. We can't have these collisions where the lower energy particles gives energy to our higher energy particles. Is there anything that's saying we can't do that? Like, if we look at this case, we haven't broken the conservation of energy. If we say, oh, well, we have this energy, it's isolated in our system, and the slower ones, yeah, they had energy, and then they gave them away. They gave that kinetic energy to the faster ones, and now our slower particles, they're just not moving. Is there anything that prohibits that? Like conservation of energy, again, that's one of the main rules that we look at. That's one of the main laws that we argue from. It hasn't broken in this case. We haven't broken conservation of energy. We, we just put it somewhere else. We had that energy in the blue particles. Now the faster particles have them. But we know that stuff like this doesn't happen. Like So it's, it's weird because it's not breaking any of the laws that we've talked about. But we know it doesn't happen. Like this would be like a situation like if we put an ice cube in a boiling cup of water, and then suddenly we see that the ice cube starts getting colder, it starts losing that energy to the boiling water. We know that doesn't happen. So what's going on? Why doesn't this happen? And it's kind of the the reason for this is the same reason why this is weird. This video that I have right here that I'm gonna show you. So I have this video here. The same reason why the, the thing we talked about is weird is why this video feels weird. I don't know if you saw the title, but we have these car crashes. They're happening in reverse. Is Mini Cooper racing a thing? I don't know. But you see this and you're like, I know this is happening in reverse. I know this isn't right. Like, nobody would see this and be like, yep, this is playing in forward motion. Like, you see this instantly and you go, oh, this is, this is backwards. This is playing in reverse. 
first, you get a little, a little weird feeling in your stomach, you're like, this doesn't look right. There's like a few seconds where you're like, maybe this could be, but then you see that and you're like, no, 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 no. I haven't watched this full video. I don't know if they look good or not. Oh, this is a good one. Oh my gosh, they totally missed that. That's nice. But yeah, you watch this and you're like, this feels weird. Like if you showed this to somebody who doesn't know anything about physics, they would, I can guarantee they would tell you this is not the correct way that this is going. Um, so we're not going to watch the rest of this. And it also tells us why this feels weird. This idea that if you had an ice cube, um, if you, or sorry, if you had a warm cup of tea, I'm, I'm still obsessed with tea. Um, if you were sitting there and an ice cube suddenly appeared, again, that would be weird. So we have these three situations that are all kind of tied together by this one main idea. These are all irreversible processes. These are all things that we're saying don't happen backwards. They can go forwards, but they can't go forwards and backwards. They're not reversible. So irreversible processes, ones that can only happen in one direction. Um, so, yeah, so if we look at this, if we can think about the car crash example, um, we know that this can only happen one way, and that's because before this car, it has some sort of set amount of energy. It has this kinetic energy, it has some potential energy, maybe it has some thermal energy from the engine, but then after that crash, when that crash is happening, you have it hitting the side of the wall, or you have it hitting the pavement, you saw sparks flying. You take this kinetic energy and you turn it into thermal energy. So we lose some of this energy to thermal energy and we can't get it back into our system. And that reason is based on something that we're gonna talk about in just a second. If we think about those particles that are colliding, like either particles in tea or particles in the boiling water, or particles from that beginning example. Um, if we think about this microscopic example, really we kind of have a reason for this. And this is the reason that we're gonna talk about right now. So the reason is this idea of entropy. And entropy is a state function, just like pressure, temperature, number of moles, or volume. So if we have a specific configuration, that configuration has a property, just like we had with pressure, temperature. When we had those PV graphs, we said, oh, okay, at some specific point on this PV graph, this uh, system has some sort of specific pressure, a specific temperature, specific number of, vol number of moles, and a specific volume. That's a state, it's a property of where you're at, a property of just your system. So entropy is the same thing, it's also a property of the system, and there's different ways to think about it, there's different definitions. Um, the main one that people usually go with is this idea that entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. So how ordered is your system, or how disordered is it? That's kind of a very simplified definition for it. It works, it helps us think about things, but it kind of takes away a lot of the, the interesting pieces about entropy. So you can think about it like that, kind of, if you want to like start off thinking about it as a measure of disorder of the system. But then one of our main ideas, one of the, the kind of better definitions of it is how spread out the energy actually is. So how spread out is our energy? And we're going to look at these definitions in a little bit and kind of go deeper with them. Um, or the unavailability of the system to do work. So we'll look at that even later on. And really this whole entropy thing, it's very cool. If you take like a thermodynamics class um, in college or later on, usually it'll either be called thermodynamics or it'll be called something like statistical mechanics. Like I think uh, my brother took kind of the same, or he, he took the, the chemistry one, so it's called physical chemistry. Um, but some people take like thermodynamics and it's called like statistical mechanics. It's called StatMech or something cool like that. Um, so it's really this function of statistics and probability, this idea of entropy, is this measure of disorder and how spread out our energy is. So what this means, we're going to do another kind of thought experiment. So let's say you come upon a sample of gas and someone says that the sample of gas is at 300 kelvins, kind of a, a uh, above room temperature, whatever. So you know that this temperature, 300 kelvins, is based on the average kinetic energy of these particles. And if we think about this, like how are we getting this average kinetic energy to be 300 kelvins, or to, to work out, to provide a temperature of 300 kelvins, right? The, the temperature is not an energy, but it's based on it. So how can we work it out so that the average kinetic energy gives us a temperature of 300 kelvins? So what we talked about before is we kind of said, well, if we looked at these particles, if we zoomed in on a microscopic scale, what would we, we would see that not all of the particles have the same kinetic energy, 
And really we have this distribution where the average kinetic energy is giving us a specific temperature. So we had these distributions before that we called Maxwell distributions. And they really just tell us how many particles are moving at a certain speed. So we see that most of the particles in this case, it looks like the average speed is at about 150 meters per second. Again, the speed is going to correlate to the kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy is going to correlate to the temperature. So it tells us, hey, a lot of particles are around this kinetic or the speed of 150 uh, meters per second. Some of them are a little bit further away from it, where our y-axis is, again, measuring how many particles you actually have at that given speed. So we have a few more that are a little bit slower, a few that are a little bit faster. The more we go away, the more deviations we have. We have some that are moving very slowly, but not a lot. And we have some that are moving very quickly, but again, it's not a lot of them. It's just a few of them. But most of these particles are landing around 150, somewhere between 100 and 200. Most of them are going about the average speed. So again, some are moving faster, some are going slower. And I'm going to pull this plot up really quick because we did a little lab about it, and I think it's kind of cool to look at. Uh, please load. My phone pulled up here. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so, oh, my calculator just fell down. That's weird. Um, so we have this idea that if we increase the temperature, this curve spreads out. We have this kind of spread out where if we increase the temperature, we know that the kinetic energy increases and we know that the average speed is then going to increase. So then we'll have more particles that are kind of peaking around there. But the amount of particles we have has to come from somewhere, right? We, before we have, I don't know, this many particles, like whatever the area of that is, I guess. We have that many particles, that many number of particles has to be the thing that's spreading out. So we see that our curve gets lower, it gets less steep, because those particles, the number of particles we have is spreading out, and that peak is happening around a greater average speed. So again, yeah, we just kind of said that, but if the temperature increases, the average speed shifts to the right, the curve is going to flatten because the number of particles is constant, and they have to become more spread out. So we said... Yeah, we have this distribution where we see the particles are all spread out, but there's nothing, there's absolutely, right now, based on what we know, there's nothing that says that this can't happen. This idea where, hey, we have to look at the average kinetic energy of our particles. Let's say we have most of our particles not moving, and one particle that's moving incredibly, incredibly quickly. So we'd look at it and we'd be like, okay, well the average is still going to be 300. If you took the average, you'd add up all the speeds, so you'd have some giant number plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 divided by the total number of particles you have. You can still have an average of 300 kelvins, or I guess you'd measure the speed. But you can have an average kinetic energy that will get you a temperature of 300 K, 300 kelvins, even if most of your particles aren't moving, theoretically, there's nothing saying that we can't have this. But we know that that doesn't happen. This feels weird. And the reason for this is entropy. So in this case that we're looking at, this has a high entropy. So let's think about uh, our definitions of entropy, what we talked about. We said entropy is a measurement of disorder, this idea about how ordered your system is. If we look at this case, we have a very, very ordered system. If we looked at it, and like if we were thinking about sitting in class, we would say this is a very organized classroom. Most of the, the students, if we're thinking about the students as being particles, most of the students in this classroom are just kind of sitting there. One person's kind of going crazy, but overall, this is very ordered. There, there's order to this. Everything is kind of where it is. Every time you look at it, they're staying in the same location. But there's one exception, but I mean, as a whole, we have a lot of order here. So there's only a small amount of disorder. Um, so yeah, our disorder is low, and we said this entropy is a measurement of disorder. So we have low disorder, we have low entropy. Sorry, I, I wrote high entropy up there, but I need to say, um, in this case, we actually have a low entropy. That's my bad. So we have low entropy. My bad. Sorry about that. So yeah, in this case, we have low entropy because we have a low amount of disorder. The higher the disorder, the higher amount of entropy. So this is very ordered. Um, and then we also said uh, entropy is a measurement of the concentration of our energy. So we said that in general, when we think about it, let's go back to that. Entropy is a measure of how spread out the energy is. 
So in this case, we don't have a very much spread out energy. Most of our energy is concentrated, I guess in this case, all of our energy is concentrated in one particle. So our energy is not very spread out, meaning we have a low concentration of, or we have a high concentration. All of our energy is very concentrated, which means we have a low amount of entropy. We don't have this distribution of our energy. So what could happen in this case? If we were thinking about statistically, if we, were, if we zoomed in on this case and we thought about, okay, probability-wise, what could happen? This is kind of, I guess we can relate it to the, no, I'm not going to relate it to the DVD thing with the DVD bouncing around, but whatever. We have this one fast particle that's moving around. So over time, if we think about what could be happening, as time goes on, the most likely situation is that the fast particle is going to collide with the other particles and will give them energy. So it's like what we talked about when we did momentum before. We're going to have these collisions, and this particle will collide with other particles, and it'll give them energy. And other particles will then speed up, and this one that we have, the moving one, it'll slow down. After a long amount of time, this is going to keep on happening, and the energy will be dispersed until it's shared by all of the particles. So we'll have these particles speeding up, colliding with each other, crashing with each other, and giving energy to each other. One starts out with all the energy, and then it kind of gets redistributed. Um, so the amount of energy in the system, it hasn't changed. We started out with all the kinetic energy in one particle. All we're doing is redistributing it. So the energy becomes more spread out, and when this happens, when we have this energy more spread out, we have this irreversible process. It would be very, 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 very unlikely, statistically, for these collisions to happen in reverse. So you go from one particle with a lot of energy, it gives it off and we have all these collisions, and then all of our particles are moving and kind of interchanging this energy. That's likely, that's something that could happen. It would be nearly impossible for the reverse to happen, for these fast moving particles to collide with each other in a perfect way so that they all come to a stop and to have that happen just so at the very last one kind of gives all of its energy to this final particle. That is something that is not going to happen. So this process is irreversible, and our energy becomes more spread out. So when we're thinking about entropy, we're really looking at these irreversible processes. And when this happens, so our energy becomes more spread out. It becomes spread out over more particles. So we see this entropy increase. And the system became more disordered. If you think about what that classroom would look like, instead of a bunch of particles sitting still or a bunch of students sitting still in their seats, you have everybody running all over the place. Maybe they're not moving as quickly as the first kid, but you have a lot of disorder. Everything's moving around. So energy is more spread out, and the system becomes more disordered. So we can say the entropy increased. We went from a state of low entropy to higher entropy. And if we think about when it stops, it's going to stop we talked about this before, um, but it's going to stop when the net energy transfer stops when the system is at thermal equilibrium. So when the particles, when we're at thermal equilibrium, these particles can still transfer energy with each other, but it's because they're all kind of moving at the same average speed, we won't really have a net transfer of energy. If you have something moving at 5 meters per second and something moving at 5 meters per second, they collide with each other, they'll just both bounce off at 5 meters per second. Sure, maybe we'd have a lower moving particle, a slower one, collide with a faster one, but as a whole, we have so many particles. Overall, there's not going to be this significant net transfer of energy. So as this happens, we'll see we'll have more of these collisions. Excuse me, sorry. When everything's moving the same speed, we'll run out of this net transfer of energy, and everything will kind of level off at this same speed. So when this happens, our processes stop. We stop transferring energy. So what we're going to say is that the entropy is maximized at thermal equilibrium. This is where we have the most disorder, where we have the most particles moving and our energy is most spread out. So entropy is going to be maximized when we're at thermal equilibrium, and that's what's going to dictate this end to transferring thermal energy. And I kind of, it's kind of a weird idea. But if we're thinking about this, this is all a probabilistic thing. This is all happening because of probability. I think that's just one of the coolest things, is that this whole entire way that the universe functions, this movement of particles, everything is dictated by probability and statistics. Thinking about what is the most statistically probable thing to happen, that's typically what's going to happen. So everything is made up of these particles, and they're all dictated by statistics and what is most likely to happen. I think that's really cool.
Um, so if we think about this entropy increase or decrease in terms of a probability perspective, um, if we think about it, there's really only one chance for us to have this ordered system. If we think about it, we defined this as something that's highly ordered. This is really, there's one way to do this. You would have to set all of those particles to not move and one particle to move. So there's really only one way to have one particle moving is to have this setup where we have that one particle moving and the other particles staying still. There's a really low chance of that happening to kind of have this situation where you have one particle moving and the rest are staying still. That's really hard to do. Um, but you have so many more chances to get disorder. You have more chances that the particles will be moving. Like, yeah, so I think that's kind of a hard thing to understand. But there's a little analogy that can kind of help us out. So if we think about IKEA furniture, this is, I, I bought this, this is in our apartment. And I put it all together in one night, and it was stressful. But <laughs> this right here, this is kind of a full put together TV stand. This is ordered. This is all of our pieces, our particles are ordered. They're where they're supposed to be. They're, they have this low disorder. They're where they're supposed to be. And it's made up of all these particles. And we'll show you the little equipment list right here. Whatever, don't, yeah. Um, so we have four of those, 12 of those, 20 of those, two of these, 26, 24. One, one, eight, two, one of these, these little nails. We have a bag of these, we have the, the rails, we have the, the wooden pieces. Um, and there's directions on how we can get this to become this, this chaotic system, all these particles, to something that's ordered. There's one way to do it. We can follow these steps and we end up with a nice TV stand that everything is in the order that it goes. So, if we think about this kind of relating this back, there is a non-zero chance that it's very low, but there is a non-zero chance that I could take out all of the pieces, take them all out of the box, blindfold myself. I don't know why I gave myself the blindfold stipulation because I don't think that would help. And I held on to all these pieces. There is technically a non-zero chance that I could throw all of these pieces and they would be ordered. I would throw out all the pieces, I'd throw them up in the air, and they would all land in such a perfect way that the IKEA furniture would be put together. So that is an ordered system. There's a very low chance that in all that chaos, all that randomness, we get an ordered system out. That is not very likely, but technically there is a non-zero chance that that could happen. But if we think about it, it's more likely we have disorder because there's a lot more chances for disorder. Maybe I throw them all and I don't know one of the shelves is on where another shelf could be. That would be crazy but that's still disordered if, if one of the shelves is out of place. But more likely all the pieces would be on the floor but there's lots of ways that the pieces could be on the floor. I could have one piece there and one piece there or I could have that piece here and that piece there. I could have that piece there and that piece there. There's so many more chances of disorder. There's so many more ways that we can put this not together. If we have all the pieces just scattered around the floor at different locations, that's technically not put together. There's so many ways that we could do that. There's one chance for order, and there's so many more chances of disorder. So our pieces could be doing whatever they want that's disordered. So if we think about this from a statistics perspective, the same kind of thing with these particles moving. There's a low chance for this really, really, really highly ordered system where all of our particles are staying still and one is kind of doing its thing with its energy. It's a low chance, but it's a lot higher chance for all these particles to be disordered and kind of moving around. So this is statistics. All of this is happening because of statistics. So the same thing is happening with our particles. Chance one of them could have all the energy, but it's statistically more possible that they have collided and the energy is distributed. Yeah, yeah. So really what entropy is kind of getting to is the second law of thermodynamics. So it's one of these laws that we can argue from. So the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the entropy of an isolated system is never going to decrease. The entropy is either going to increase until the system reaches thermal equilibrium, or if the system began in thermal equilibrium, 
the entropy will stay the same. So entropy will either increase or stay the same. And entropy is maximum when the system is in thermal equilibrium. So we'll either increase until thermal equilibrium or we'll get to thermal equilibrium and our entropy will stay constant, but entropy will never decrease in an isolated system. Second law of thermodynamics, that's a guarantee. So again, we just said the entropy, kind of defining that, just to get back to that idea. The entropy is a measurement of disorder. So if we have a lot of disorder, we have high entropy. If we have a little bit of disorder and mostly order, we have low entropy. If we have our energy spread out throughout our system, that's high entropy. If we have our energy kind of concentrated in a few particles or in a few locations, that is going to be a high entropy. So spread out energy is going to be higher entropy. More concentrated energy is going to be lower entropy. So yeah, disorder or spread outedness of energy. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this. Let me kind of shift this over. So the second law of thermodynamics, um, what do I mean by this? Oh, it, it has this really cool consequence to it. And this, you don't have to know this, but I just think it's kind of a cool idea that we can get to because entropy is, it's guiding everything. It's, it's kind of telling us everything that can happen. And it has so many, it has so many laws to the rules of the universe. But so we have this idea that isolated systems will flow towards equilibrium in order to maximize the entropy. Equilibrium means maximum entropy, where we kind of have this most disordered state possible. And this flow has a direction. We go from lower entropy to higher entropy. So that's like the only way we can go. We can't go from higher to lower. We have to go from lower entropy, more disorder, more concentrated energy, to higher entropy. Less, or sorry, more disorder, and then uh, less concentrated energy. I think I said that wrong the first time. So low entropy is low disorder, um, concentrated energy. High entropy is going to be less concentrated energy, so the energy is more spread out, and we're going to have more disorder. And we have this theory proposed by a physicist, Arthur Eddington, and it's this idea of this arrow of time. Because energy, or entropy, sorry, entropy has to go from low entropy to high entropy, now we have this distinguishment between past and future. Before, if we don't have this, there's no distinction between past or future. Time is just this this const, this thing that is not even constant. It's this thing that doesn't mean anything. We can't distinguish the past from the future. Nobody can prove what happened in the past. So we don't have any ways to really distinguish, hey, this happened in the past. This idea of entropy lets us define directions at time, which is so cool. This idea that we can now define a past because the past had lower entropy. And we can define a future because a future has higher entropy. So it gives us this direction of time. Uh, we can actually distinguish past from future. So if we think back about this car crash example, with a car crash, we know that the car crash happens after the uncrashed car. Um, so we, we know that before the car crashed, it was uncrashed. After the car crashed, it was crashed. And we have, oh wow, that was a big wind gust. Um, we have entropy to explain for that. We can look at this and say, well, thermal energy left our system energy spread out from the car and now we see that this energy kind of spread out in a way that it could and now we have this crashed car we see the energy spread out and we know in the past the car wasn't crashed and now the car is crashed we, we saw energy spread out so if there's no entropy what we could do is we could technically say okay if thermal energy didn't spread out we could get this thermal energy back put it back in the car and put it back together perfectly and reverse that process Be but because we have entropy this process, it's not reversible. Um, so, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then we can kind of talk about it from the ice perspective, too. Um, ice is a more ordered state. Ice is more ordered than having this water because the particles kind of have this defined state. We know that solids have a very organized structure. So ice is more ordered than boiling water and the energy is more concentrated by being contained in just the boiling water. So we kind of have these two ideas. Um, if we have a system, again, of ice and boiling water, if we think about it, first, most of the energy is concentrated in the boiling water, and the ice doesn't have as much energy, or we can argue from the fact that the ice is more ordered, and everything around it is more disordered. But so if we spontaneously made ice, if we put ice in boiling water, and more ice started to show up, um, what we could say here is, well, this kind of, this, the 
this is weird. We're getting more ice, and that's kind of breaking our flow of time that we're used to. Um, if that happened, the energy would become um, less concentrated. Sorry, it would make the energy... Okay, sorry. Um, so if we wanted to make more ice, um, we would have to kind of reverse this flow. It would be really weird. We would take our ice, which needs to be colder, and we would have to give off energy to the boiling water. But that doesn't happen because in that case, most of the energy is in the boiling water. It's concentrated in the boiling water. This would make our energy more concentrated. If we gave energy from our ice to the boiling water, it would put it more in this concentrated water. That would be weird. We know that doesn't happen. So entropy is kind of dictating this idea that we're not just making ice and we're not having this reverse kind of refreezing in boiling water, which we know doesn't happen with time. Or we could also say, well, the system would make, it would become more ordered if we took this water and it turned to ice. So ice is, again, this solid structure. It has this nice structure to it. It has this order to it. If we suddenly made our boiling water ice, these particles would slow down, and we'd kind of have a more definite position for them. They'd be nice and ordered in the ice. But again, that doesn't happen. We have this flow of time. We know that when we put ice in boiling water, we can distinctly say it was ice in the past. And then as time progressed, it melted. So we have this flow of time because of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, which is very cool. Um, and then just kind of getting back earlier when we defined entropy, we had this definition that said the unavailability of some systems to do work. That's kind of a weird definition. That's kind of a hard one to think about. I think that's the hardest one to think about. Saying that it's this measure of disorder, if we have a more disordered state, we have more entropy, or the spread of energy. If our energy spread out between more particles, we have higher entropy. Those make sense. This one, the unavailability of some systems to do work, is weird. But we can think about this with kind of a thought definition, or not definition, I read the word definition, a thought experiment. So let's say that we have these particles. Right here we have this kind of divider that we can get rid of if we wanted to, and over here is a piston. So right now we have these particles and they're kind of, if we think about it, they're at a lower entropy than if we pulled that barrier out. They're at a lower entropy because of a few reasons. Number one, the energy is more concentrated. The energy is more focused in one location. It's not spread out between that whole entire chamber. It's more focused in just one side of it. The energy is more concentrated, which means that we have a lower entropy. If our energy becomes less concentrated, yeah, if our energy becomes less concentrated, um, more spread out, then it's going to be a higher entropy. Um, and then we're also more ordered. We have kind of less spots for where those particles could be. Instead of them being all over the place, they're kind of in this defined location. We could say, oh yeah, I could probably find them more. There's more order to this system than if they were all over the place. Um, so if we think about this case, if we were thinking about these particles kind of doing work on the environment, here they have this piston. In this case, these particles would collide more with the piston there's going to be more collisions than if we had the divider taken away and they could more, yeah, they, they would have more collisions in this case because there's going to just be less space, more collisions. So they can do more work on the environment. In this case, if we had higher entropy, we'd see, well, in this case, our entropy increased because we have more disorder. Those particles could be all over the place. Anywhere, say it's harder to pinpoint, they're more disordered and the energy is more spread out, so we have this higher entropy. And then one thing to kind of note, in this case, the thermal energy hasn't changed. These particles are still the same mass and have the same velocity, which means that they have the same kinetic energy. So the, the thermal energy hasn't changed, but the ability to do work has changed. We've decreased this ability to do work because now we're gonna get less collisions with that piston. It'll be able to do less work on the environment. There'll be less pressure and less ability to do work. So that's kind of weird, but we said this entropy is the unavailability of some systems to do work. This one becomes more unavailable to do work. So I think that's the weirdest definition. I don't really think that one shows up too much. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of our three definitions. Here, kind of based on this last idea, this ability to do work, here's just a quick little thought experiment that I think is really cool. Again, you don't have to know any of this stuff. Um, well, not this thing, but it's just like a really cool thought experiment. It's called Maxwell's Demon. It's uh, theorized by James Clerk Maxwell, who is a big person in terms of uh, E and M, electricity and magnetism. So big physicist, huge name. Um, most of the electricity and magnetism stuff we did is all him. 
so it's a cool thought experiment. Let's say now where you kind of have these two chambers of gas that have this partition in the middle of them. And we can move the part, remove the partition of, or actually let's not remove the partition. But let's say energy can transfer through the partition. So right now we kind of have this thermal equilibrium. I have the red faster moving particles evenly mixed with these cooler moving particles. And both sides have the same amount of faster and slower particles. I counted them out. So each side is kind of at the same energy. Um, we're going to have about the same amount of collisions on that middle partition, and that partition won't move. We kind of have equal temperature and therefore equal pressure on both sides. But what if, let's kind of picture this situation, and they made this back in the olden days, in the olden days, I don't know, they made it a long time ago, so demons were like, whoa, that would be bad. I don't know why they called it a demon, but they were like, what if a demon was sitting in this little partition and he could open up a door to kind of sort these particles? So again, we have the same amount of particles with the same velocity. We're not exchanging energy. We're just sorting them. So what if he was, every time he saw one of these fast particles come in, and he was like, okay, I'll open the door, and I'll get all the fast particles on one side. And then every time he saw a, a colder particle come in by the door, he said, okay, I'm going to open the door, get them on one side. So he's kind of sorting these. He's, he's sorting them so we'd have all the faster ones on the left and all the slower ones on the right. So again, conservation of energy is satisfied. We haven't changed the amount of energy in our system. We have the same kinetic energy overall in our system and therefore the same amount of thermal energy. But now if we think about it, we're gonna be able to do work. That's really weird. Before the partition had the same pressure on both sides, it wasn't moving, it wasn't being pushed, there's no work being done on it. But in this case, we have faster particles on the left, we're gonna have more collisions we'll be able to push this divider. We'll be able to do work on our system. So now we can do work. That's really weird. So that seems like it should work out, right? Like if we had this demon, and theoretically if this was possible, it seems like, okay, nothing's been broken here. We've been able to satisfy this. It would be a little bit hard for the demon, but yeah, you could do it. It seems like everything's being satisfied. But the reason why this isn't possible and kind of why we can say, no, that's not going to work, is because of our second law of thermodynamics. One of the main stipulations, one of the main things we've said is that the second law of thermodynamics is gonna hold if we're in an isolated system. So if our system is isolated. So the demon is not a gas, he's outside the system of gases. So by putting him in there, we have some sort of outside object interfering with our system. So in this case, yeah, we can locally uh, decrease the entropy of our system if we have something from the outside interfering with our system. That's what a refrigerator does. Refrigerators are going to locally decrease the entropy of our system, but overall, if we kind of expand our system, expand what we care about, it takes energy to run your refrigerator. It takes a lot of energy to run it. So overall, the entropy is going up, but locally we can say, yeah, we can locally decrease the entropy of our system. So that's kind of a cool thing. But overall, if we have kind of this contained system, then the entropy is going to only increase. Um, and if we were gonna put the demon in the system, if we we're gonna include him in there, he would get tired and he would need food or something to supply him with energy. So he'd have to take energy from outside the system and we would still be able to, we'd have this no longer isolated system, but if we didn't let him eat or anything, he would probably die. Um, and I don't know if that'd be sad or not. I don't know if it's bad if demons, I guess you don't want anything to die, but demons aren't bad. I don't know, whatever. Um, but so if we got rid of him, um, if we didn't give him any outside energy, then he would eventually die, and then this would go back to disorder. Uh, so kind of wrapping up, we had these four things that we were going to link up in the beginning. So if we had ice and we put in a boiling pot of water, why does ice melting, how does that satisfy the second law of thermodynamics? Well, we said, well, when ice is melting, or sorry, when ice is in a solid state, the particles are very ordered. And if we melt it, it's going to increase the disorder. It's going to increase the entropy, the liquid form and then gas form more all over the place. The particles are all spread out. They can go all over the place. They're not kind of stuck in these contained little wells. So we have more um, disorder. We increase the entropy if this ice melts. Or we can say, well, the energy that was contained in the boiling water is more concentrated. Um, we don't want this concentrated energy. If we have this increase in entropy, we kind of have this spreading out of our energy. So if we kind of add our energy to the ice, 
then our energy becomes more spread out and we fulfill this second law. We fulfill this idea that the energy is more spread out now, it's less concentrated in just that boiling water, it's spread out over all of our particles. So we've satisfied entropy, we've satisfi satisfied this increase in entropy. Another one, why is perpetual motion not possible? So perpetual motion is kind of this really cool idea in physics. It's this idea um, that we can maybe create some sort of machine that is going to infinitely run under its own power. So under its own devices, it will be able to infinitely run. Here's kind of an example of one. I don't know if it's real or a simulation, and it's definitely looping. You can see where it loops. There, it just looped. Um, but so why is this not possible? So again, we can cite the second law of thermodynamics, this idea that in this case, when those balls are rolling down, there's going to be some energy lost to thermal energy. And this thermal energy, it's not a reversible process. When we have this energy loss to thermal energy, this energy is spreading out. This energy is spreading out, and therefore entropy has increased. And we said that locally within a system, the entropy is only going to increase. This energy is only going to become more spread out. So we lose this energy to thermal energy. Our energy becomes more spread out. We've increased our entropy in that system. And therefore, we've satisfied the second law of thermodynamics. Um, if we were going to have to keep this thing running, we'd have to kind of push it or something to get it back going again. We'd have to give it more energy. But then we'd lose this idea of a system. We break this system of just the motion machine. We interfere with it from the environment. This one is really cool. The heat death of the universe, or also called the big chill or the big freeze, is this theory, and it's based entirely in the second law of thermodynamics, but it says that the theory that the universe will end because we'll run out of usable energy. This idea that the universe is the ultimate, the, sorry, the ultimate isolated system. There's nothing outside the universe. Everything that ever has and ever will be exists within our universe, and there's nothing that we can get outside of this universe to get energy and so the universe itself is an isolated system there's nothing outside of it and because it's an isolated system it has to follow the second law of thermodynamics this idea that the universe will eventually evolve to this thermal equilibrium it will constantly be increasing its entropy until we reach thermal equilibrium until it remains constant entropy so eventually we'll reach thermal equilibrium we'll no longer be able to produce usable energy and there won't be any more ability to transfer heat. We said to, to transfer heat, we need this change in temperature. So we'll just kind of freeze and die off because we won't have any more heat. We won't be able to use any more energy, and that'd be a bummer. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, I don't know, put that image down there. But like in here, we definitely have work done. We have this usable energy. In this case, when we're at this thermal equilibrium, that partition we said was set, and we don't have this push anymore. We don't have, we can't get work from heat anymore. And then the last one, we said time travel, um, just kind of going back to it. But as we said before, we can't go back in time because of entropy. Entropy is defining this arrow of time. Entropy can't decrease. And going back in time is a process that will decrease the entropy. We'll go back to a more ordered state of the universe. So because of the second law, we can't do it. It's kind of wrapping up key takeaways. Entropy is an, um, in an isolated system, entropy is either increasing or it's constant and it will be constant if it's already at thermal equilibrium. We said that entropy is a measurement of disorder. So if we have high disorder, we have high entropy. If we have low disorder, or if we have a very ordered system, we could say, then we have low entropy. It's a measurement of how concentrated the energy of a system is. If our energy is very concentrated in a few particles or in a few locations, then we have low entropy. But if our energy is more spread out over multiple particles or over multiple locations, and we have higher entropy. This is all fueled by probability. What is the most probable state that we could be in? And then finally, we kind of said the temperature of an arrangement of gas can be modeled as a probabilistic distribution. So we said, oh yeah, we could track out the, the energies based on this uh, Boltzmann distribution. And that's kind of the review lecture for that. Um, hopefully it's kind of interesting. I think entropy is really cool. And yeah, then I'll give you some project or problems to work on. Yeah.